So that we we just think in terms of the forces on the object returning to equilibrium when that that gives us our answers about velocity and acceleration. Okay. But the mass always overshoots equilibrium. This is where we get to talk about the world with no friction. This would be eh, that happens. I need to get tape on this. So if, if there was no friction, if we were in a frictionless vacuum, this thing would oscillate about equilibrium forever. And what we call the effect of friction on a mass spring system or on a pendulum system is dampening. It has a dampening effect on oscillation. Would yes. Gravity would affect it. Nope. Be okay, that's a great question. So why wouldn't gravity slow it down in it would just extend it in the other direction. It would extend it down, the spring would return it. It would extend it down, spring would return it. And so, yeah, it's, it's not gravity that slows it down. It's, yeah, it's friction. And, I mean, air resistance and probably some internal friction of the material also. So, some internal resistance. I, I can't vouch for that, absolutely, but um, we'd have to ask an engineer. Yeah, it really would. Okay. Um, yeah. So after after a couple billion years, presumably the metal would wear. You know. Of course, no. That that wear is due to internal friction, isn't it? So maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. I don't know. Well, in a frictionless vacuum, in a vacuum, there'd be no oxygen, no rust. I don't know. But those are good questions. I don't know the answers. So I like questions. I don't know the answers to. All right, um, we talk about the force that wants to return the spring to equilibrium as restoring force. It's also called spring force. Do you remember? Oh, we didn't, we didn't do the spring force constants yet, did we? Oh, good, that's coming. Okay. Huh? We did, yeah, we did. We did K for elastics. Okay, good. That's all it is. And this is very, very much related to the elastic potential energy. Um, restoring force or spring force is directly proportional to displacement of the mass. Translation, the further you pull it back, the harder it's going to smack you in the face when you let go. Okay? Don't go home and do homework with a bungee cord on this concept. <laughs> yes, it would hurt a lot. I know people who've gotten hit in the face with big bungee cords. So when the, def when the amount of deformation is larger, the restoring force is larger. A smaller deformation yields a smaller restoring force. Okay. Restoring force is the force that attempts to return the spring back to the equilibrium position. Okay. Remind you of anything at Kennywood? If you don't like roller coasters, you can go on this at Kennywood. The pendulum ride. It's a pendulum. That's all it is. It's a big pendulum. Anytime we have a simple periodic, a periodic motion, so something which recurs periodically or cycles through a series of positions, and restoring force is proportional to displacement, we call it simple harmonic motion. Okay? It's always over the same path. Now, there, there's some, some fudge in that, like our spring bounces around a little bit, moves around a little bit, but anytime we've got something traveling over the same path repeatedly, and we've got a restoring force, and a displacement, that's a simple harmonic motion. So there are examples of this all around you in real life. And let's see if I can get this oops, video to play. No, I can't. Okay, so. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's embedded. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to. So anyway, um, this is where we get into Hooke's Law. I don't care that you know who Hook is. I don't care that you know... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not Captain Hook. I don't care that you remember that this is Hook's law. I care that you remember how it works. The force of the spring is the inverse of the spring constant times the deformation. Why is it an inverse? Because the restoring force wants to return it in the opposite direction of the deformation. So the restoring force is in the opposite direction of the deformation. Um, this works for small displacements. So for small displacements, we're, we're talking about, you know, kind of within the range of reason. 
if we took this spring, attached it to a bumper, and started driving north, we would no longer be dealing with a small force. All bets are off at that point uh, because we've, we've sort of gone beyond the limits of the material. So this is, this is within the limits of the material. <clears throat> All right. You've already done this. You just didn't know you were doing it. My picture's missing. <laughs> um, we've established the, force, the spring force is equal to the inverse of the spring constant times deformation. Um, because the force is in the opposite direction from the displacement, K is that spring constant. We talked about this with elastic potential energy. A stiffer spring will have a higher K value. Something with a very low K value is a very soft spring. It's not going to give you a big return. Um, this has actually got a pretty low K value probably. Um, we could get a much stiffer spring here. I mean, this is deforming with two, 350 grams of mass. We could get a spring in here that would support a bowling ball. Um, sure. It's a little, a little bit more dangerous. And, and, and to connect it all, to connect it all back to real life and kinesthetic experience, which is going to hurt more if it snaps back on you? High or low K value? High K value is going to hurt like all get out because there's more what? More force accelerating the mass back towards equilibrium. So it's all connected. Oh, goody. Okay. Dimensional analysis. And this is the same thing we did for elastic potential energy. Um, spring constants in newtons per meter. Newtons equals newtons per meter times meters. It works. It works nicely. So now we're going to do a sample problem, 12A, page 440.